everybody. My name is Tracy Allen, and I'm going to talk to you about my community health project for anthro medical anthropology. The title of my paper was Cajun Folk Medicine in the Chafalaya Basin. I met a retired anthropologist in the area by the name of Jim Delahousey, and he, in conversation, he told me that he had recorded 96 voice recordings of Cajuns that lived in the Atchafalaya area. And so um, I thought it'd be really interesting to listen to the tapes. And he told me some of the stories and the stories were really intriguing. He didn't have the tapes anymore. He had uploaded them to the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. But I was able to get the transcripts from the Library of Congress by email. And I searched the transcripts on anything having to do with health, illness, medicine, treatments, so I could get an idea of how the Cajun folk medicine, how it kind of worked. Um, there were, I found about 32 different conversations, so I kind of summarized it in the paper so that I could kind of like get an idea of what was going on with their practices. Um, the, um, the, the interviews that Jim Delahousey did was a narrative format. Uh, he was an ethnographic kind of, he, I don't think he knew he was doing an ethnographic project. I think he just wanted to record the, the people. He uh, worked in the area, he not only taught, but he liked to hunt and fish and he crossed fish for a living uh, to make money. So he kind of was already integrated into the group. So they were real comfortable with him. And then he uh, set up like some questions and then he met him at designated areas. And then he just talked to him, had him talk openly about their lifestyle and what they did. And they, um, they talked about religion, money, marriage, death, um, medicines, just everything you could think of. Um, the one thing that I kind of saw from the conversations, I mean, he was a very good interviewer, that the, the people there were real, they, they lived real hard. It was, I don't know how they made a living. It was just so hot and unbelievable, but they chose to do that. They wanted to live there because they thought it'd be easier to get food and easier to live in the basin than it would be to live in the city. So I got um, a lot of their information together, which I'm going to share some of that with you right now. I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, the Chafalaya River was a branch of the Mississippi River. It's in the center of Louisiana. Um, it uh, is surrounded by a swamp area. It's really big. It's considered the largest swamp in the United States. Uh, it's very hot, muggy, very wet, and people live there all the time. They live on houseboats, camp boats, uh, makeshift houses. They um, make their clothing out of like flour sacks and a lot of times they don't have shoes. So um, I gleaned all the information I could about uh, their medical practices and I have some, I have it summarized in my, um, the tra I got seven transcripts out of the 96 that had medicine. So that's the ones that are reported on. I'm gonna to talk to you about them right now. Um, the first one that they talked about, which they talked about a lot was camphor. Um, might sound familiar because you've probably seen it in cough drops or Vicks Vapor Rub. Uh, it stays green all winter long, so it's easy to spot. It kind of reminds me of a bay leaf. You crush the leaf, and then when you smell it, it smells like Vicks Vapor Rub. They would boil this. They would put it in their, um, uh, they would put it a rag in it or a piece of flannel or wool, and you could put it on your chest. You could throw it in your back. Uh, one story is one family stayed up all night long putting it on someone's back. Uh, to cure him of pneumonia, and then it worked. Um, the next one that um, was real prevalent that, that they used a lot was, I can find it, it's something you'll probably recognize, is the willow. This is called, this is the black willow. It's the only one prevalent in Louisiana. Uh, you see the leaves are real long and skinny. They, um, they, you can make a tea out of the bark, or you could boil the leaves or the bark, and you could use it as a treatment for just a little bit about everything. Um, one story said that he had fever, so they rolled him up in a sheet with leaves, which I presume that were steamed or they were boiled. They rolled him up and left him in the sheet all night until he got the fever went down. So they have different treatments that they use with that. Um, another treatment that they it was real, real prominent was what they call a swamp lily. We call it the spider lily. It is definitely a lily. You can see how thick the uh, stem is. Um, and it has a distinctive cup on it. It looks kind of like a morning glory to me, and it has these little pieces that come out. You can you pull up the roots, and then you boil the roots, and it's good for a baby's cutting teeth or soaking your feet in it or um, some other little treatments they said that they used every now and then. Um, but one of my books said it's very poisonous, so I would not try this at home. 
Um, and probably my favorite out of all of them was the use of roaches in their treatment. Um, I got a Louisiana roach. I don't know if you have roaches where you live. Um, this one is pretty big. Um, and one of the treatments is that <clears throat> you mash it up and put it in beef or hog tallow, and then you could apply it to an infection or a boil or anything that you had a red streak going up your leg. Supposedly, they believe that it has antimicrobial abilities. Um, they also talk very frequently about something they call risky roaches. Um, I made a sample of it here. It is um, the way you make it. I talked to Jim Delahousie to see, because they didn't talk about it in the narrative on how they make it. <clears throat> they um, take 10 living roaches, they put it in a pint of whiskey, and the roaches have to drown in the whiskey. And when they, they are drowning, they release a white substance, and that's the substance they believe, they leave it in the whiskey, and that's the substance they believe is the curative. Uh, there was a story of a guy who had lockjaw, and they called the doctor, and the doctor couldn't be there for a couple of hours. So they pried open his mouth and gave him a two, couple teaspoons of this, and his lockjaw went away. And when the doctor came, he was cured of his lockjaw. Um, and these are actually plastic roaches. So uh, my, a friend of mine is an entomologist, and he lends me these. So anyway, so they used it for all kinds of stuff. If they had an infection, they didn't know how to cure it, then that would work every time. I talked to an entomologist. The entomologist loaned me the plastic roaches, and he said that they're, they're re researching roaches right now because they may have antimicrobial ability in their gut because they, um, you know, they live in like dirty areas, so they have to be able to fight infections. So it's a possibility that that's how that works. Uh, they talked about other, they had all kinds of other treatments. One was they got a snake bite and they used gunpowder. They lit it on the snake bite and the person was fine. They use oils, alligator oils, castor oil for different kinds of treatments. So how about summarizing the paper? Um, what I want to say in closing is that my takeaway is that the human will and cultures are so strong that they find a way and they use natural things. Everything I talked about is all natural to the area and they use, use natural things to keep the culture alive. So I hope you enjoyed my talk and um, thank you very much.